check one two three check mic check one two three Mic check one two three. All right. <clears throat> We're going to continue talking about comfort to the discouraged. This comfort that is found in the scriptures. This comfort that. Uh, is found in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please turn with me once again to Hebrews chapter 4. And we'll read verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Last week we had begun looking at this great passage in the book of Hebrews, and we have seen how the apostle presents two solutions to the problem of discouragement in the life of the born-again Christian. Now, once again, as I have said last week, you must understand that Hebrews is doctrinally aimed at a Jew in the tribulation. Okay, it's a transitional book, a transition from God's dealing with the Gentiles to God's dealing with the Jews, once again in the tribulation. So he is addressing Jews who are undergoing intense persecution, intense suffering in the tribulation. So that's why these words become relevant even to us because we have seen last week born again Christians are also uh, called to partake uh, in sufferings for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we have seen in Philippians 1.29, it has been given to you not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to suffer on his behalf, to suffer for his sake. So Christians here will go through tribulation. I'm not talking about that kind of a tribulation which is there on the earth for seven years, but there will be trouble. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. So I'm talking about the sufferings that a born again Christian will go through in this life. And the devil can use these sufferings in your life to discourage you so that your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ would not be what it ought to be. He will make sure that you are discouraged in your spiritual life. You're discouraged in every aspect of your life so that your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ diminishes and you are no longer in a position to trust the Lord with all your problems, to trust the Lord in every situation. That's what the devil wants to accomplish in your life. But God says that he has given you the solution here in the scriptures. When you go through discouragement as a result of sufferings in your life, what you have to do is you have to remember this great truth found in this passage as we have seen. And the first part of this is to hold fast our profession. That's the first part of this solution God offers to you. He says you need to know what you have believed in. You need to know whom you have believed in. Remember what Paul says, for I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul was so confident that what he has committed to Jesus Christ is safe. He knew whom he has believed in and he says so in very uncertain terms, for I know whom I have believed. <coughs> and that's the first part profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means, Christian, you need to have a very high and exalted view of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know how great our Lord is. You need to know how glorious he is. You need to know him personally and you need to know about him through personal experience in the scriptures. Because unless you know whom you have believed in, your faith will not be strong. That's why in this two-part solution, the first part 
comes first. Holding fast to your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the first uh, part of the solution. Unless you know whom you have believed in, you cannot find any comfort from him because you won't trust him at all with your problems and your sufferings. And we have seen what it is that we need to believe about the Lord Jesus Christ in this passage. We need to understand that uh, he is called the great high priest. He is a great high priest and we have seen uh, as a high priest that he is made higher than the heavens. He's not a human ordinary high priest. He's not uh, just anybody. He's not a priest like you see them in the Roman Catholic Church who pretend to be representing the people before God. He's not like them. He is a great high priest and we have also seen uh, last week why he is so great because firstly he has passed into the heavens. And we have seen that implies that he was here first on the earth and it implies the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, you must believe this, that when Jesus Christ was on the earth, he was 100% human. Remember what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. He says, he was, uh, though he was in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was found in fashion as a man. So God became man and when he became man, he was not half man, half God, like the gods of Greek and uh, Egyptian and Hindu mythology. No, he was not half God, half man. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man. He was a perfect human being. And we're going to look at a little bit more about that later. But you must believe that and it's important. He's a great high priest because he came down to the earth. He was a hundred percent human being. But the second thing is that he came for a purpose and the purpose was to fulfill the law and to die on the cross for our sins, to fulfill the perfect holiness, righteousness and justice of God. And that's what he did when he died on the cross. He took the sins of all mankind. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. So Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross and became sin for us, he satisfied the holiness, righteousness and justice and even the love of God. He satisfied everything. That's why he is the propitiation for our sins. He appeased God's wrath. He appeased God's anger on all mankind for being wicked and sinful. That's why he's such a great high priest. He has passed into the heavens. So once he finished his work here on the earth, he was crucified. He died on that cross. He shed his blood for our sins. He was buried and rose up again. We know that he ascended into the heavens. He passed into the heavens. But that's not the end of it. He is our great high priest, not only because he has finished all this work for our salvation and has ascended into the heaven. He is not there now saying, you know, I have finished my work. Now I'm going to relax till I have to go back a second time to the earth. No, the Bible says that as our great high priest, he is interceding for you and for me. We have seen that in Romans 8.34, that his ministry right now on the right hand of God is to intercede for you, believer. Remember that old beautiful hymn, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on your behalf appears. Yes, he's there as your advocate. He's there in your behalf, advocating for you. He's there interceding for you. For you, believer, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something you must believe very, very strongly. And never forget it, hold fast to it, that your great high priest, after finishing his work on the earth, has passed into the heavens. And now he's there on the right hand of God, seated on the throne. Not, uh, he's, you know, like these very foolish amillennialists believe, he's right now there, he has established his kingdom, and he's ruling the world. That's not what Jesus Christ is doing on the right hand of God. He's not ruling the world, sitting on his throne. He's going to come back. A second time at the end of the tribulation and then establishes Davidic kingdom and then he will rule a thousand years and then into eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. So don't believe this nonsense that Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne and ruling this world. That's not his job right now. His job right now is that of a great high priest. 
and it's his duty to intercede for you and for me praise God we have such a great high priest but that's not all in verse 14 the the apostle gives us a second reason why a high priest is such a great high priest not only because he was 100% human. He finished his work and went into the heavens. But look at verse 14. We have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Now that's, that's the second basic thing that you must know and believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the son of God. The Bible calls him the only begotten son of God. <coughs> So the thing that you must notice is that it's not just his work on the earth that gives Jesus Christ such a highly exalted position. It's also his person, who he is, that gives him such a highly exalted position. He is the son of God, the only begotten son of God. That it, you know what that implies? It implies that Jesus Christ is God. He is the same as God. He's same in essence as God. He's co-equal and co-eternal with God. He is God manifest in the flesh. This is whom you have believed in. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, of course, again, you have all these false teachings on this subject. Firstly, that Jesus Christ uh, was begotten in eternity. Remember, the Bible says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So again, the Calvinists mostly, to the most part, take this verse and say, He was begotten in eternity. Now that's, very, uh, that's a very senseless interpretation. Which day was there in eternity for God to beget a son? He is talking about the day Jesus Christ was born on the earth. He is the only begotten son of God in the sense that He is the only one to have come down from heaven and to be born on the earth as a human being. Jesus Christ is God and his divinity is emphasized. In the first part, we have seen that his humanity is emphasized. You must believe strongly in the humanity of Jesus Christ. But without believing in the divinity, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in him as a human would be futile. You would be like those liberals who believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest example for mankind to follow. Brethren, he is not. Yes, he may be the greatest example, but no man can follow him. It's impossible to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you believe that he's the greatest example, you don't get saved by that. You have to believe that he is God manifest in the flesh and he died on the cross for your sins. The second part of the deity of Christ is also something very important. Remember in verse 14, after talking about the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ, then the apostle says, let us hold fast our profession. So this is what he wants you to believe in. In the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the divinity or the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you this, <coughs> that the greatest attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is found in the modern English versions and translations. Yes, that's right. They attack the deity of Christ relentlessly throughout the New Testament. In the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, they attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, they attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout, even in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, they attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not say he's God manifest in the flesh. You know what they say? They say he was manifest in the flesh. Look at what the Bible says in the King James Version. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But the new versions remove the word God there. And they say he was manifest in the flesh. Who was manifest? They attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but you know what they do very cunningly? They uh, accuse the King James Bible of attacking the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. How is that? They find a place or two uh, where the new versions read a little bit more differently than the King James Bible and say, look, the new versions are promoting the deity of Christ, whereas the King James Bible is diminishing it. Like when, it's, uh, when Paul says, our great God 
and our Savior. They say, oh, that is diminishing the deity of Christ. So, you know, they find verses like that. If you know the English of the King James Bible, you clearly know that not once does Paul ever try to separate God and Jesus Christ and say God is a certainly deity, but Jesus Christ is not. He, it never happens in the King James Bible. They, stra they strain at gnats. That what, you know, that's what they do while they swallow camels themselves. Their versions are full of attacks against the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and a certain sentence construction in the King James Bible is attacked by them. Like the other day, one guy wrote to me and he was saying, oh, you know, how can you ever say that the King James Bible is the pure, perfect, preserved words of God? And he went into this big tangent about uh, critical uh, scholarship and textual criticism and all sorts of things trying to attack the King James Bible. And what was funny is that he said the King James Bible translates these words straining at a gnat. And he says that's wrong. That's not how you translate it. You have to translate it as training the gnat. You know what he was doing? He was training at gnats. Here you have someone with a big beam in his eye and he's trying to look for a speck of dust in the eyes of the, you know, so I'm just putting it figuratively, in the eyes of the King James Bible. And that speck is not there. A blind man looking for a speck of dust which is not there. That's how these people are. They attack, the, in the new versions, attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ time and again and try to make it look like he is not who he claimed to be. That's why all these skulls like Jehovah's Witnesses can easily diminish this great doctrine of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and say that he is a created God. Uh, like in the, uh, in the American Standard Version, the New American Standard Version. In Gospel of John chapter 1, they give them an open ground for the Jehovah's Witnesses to build their own doctrines. These new versions attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, Christian, you need to study the subject of the deity of Christ in the King James Bible and see what the Bible says about it. It's very important for you to hold fast to this profession that he is the Son of God. And that means he's equal with God. Again, there are those who believe that the doctrine of the Trinity is a fabrication of the Roman Catholic Church. Now these are fools and I just don't have patience with these guys because they are such blind fools. No matter how much scripture you show them, they, they fail or they refuse to believe the scriptures. And they say, no, 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 this is not the right doctrine. The Trinity is not found in the Bible, therefore it's not the right doctrine. Well, there are so many words not found in the Bible, but we give those terms to identify certain doctrines. So the doctrine of the Trinity is certainly found in the Bible and all three persons of the Godhead, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit are equal with each other, equal in essence. Yes, the word doesn't, uh, essence is not found in the Bible. It doesn't say Jesus Christ is equal in essence with God. It doesn't say, but there are enough scriptures to show that he is. And if you have any spiritual sense at all, if you have a single spiritual bone inside of you, then you would see that he is indeed equal with God and all three persons are equal. The Bible clearly teaches that. So Jesus Christ is the son of God. That means he is equal with God. And in 1 Timothy 3.16, the King James Bible says, he is God manifest in the flesh. And that's something very important for you as a born again believer to believe. <coughs> a high priest is not just a human being, but he's our great God and our savior who alone qualifies to be a great high priest. So here the apostle gives us two reasons why he is such a great high priest. Firstly, he's a great high priest because he was a perfect human being and he finished his sacrifice here on the earth and he ascended up into heaven and sits on the right hand of God and intercedes for you and me. That's why he's a great high priest. He was a human high priest, a perfect, 100% perfect human uh, high priest. But he's also a great high priest because he's the perfect son of God. He's the son of God. That's why he's so great. 
So the work of the Lord Jesus Christ makes him a great high priest and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ makes him a great high priest. Now let's look at verse 15. But before we do that, let me just once again remind you that this is what you need to hold fast, your profession of faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in no uncertain terms. You should never have any doubt about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the Son of God. He is God himself manifest in the flesh. Remember, even the blood inside the body of the Lord Jesus Christ is called the blood of God in Acts chapter 20 verse 28. It says that he purchased the church with his own blood. God purchased his church with his own blood. So the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is called the blood of God because he is God. He is 100% God. And so you must believe in the work and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never doubt for a moment. You know, all these cultic teachings about Jesus Christ not being really a physical person, that he's only a spirit, uh, you know, like the Gnostics taught. All these things are being resurrected once again in these last days. These heretics and these heresies are being preached nowadays by many people. That's why you must be very clear and strong in your faith in this great doctrine of the deity and humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never doubt for a moment that he physically suffered for you and me. He went to the cross. He <coughs> he was, uh, you know, they put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him. They plugged his beard. They spat on his face. They whipped him and they nailed him to that cross. And he, he bled and he died on that cross. For our sins he was buried and rose up again and this should never be a, a, a doctrine of any dispute in your mind you should be very clear very strong in your faith in this very fundamental doctrine of the bible the deity and humanity of christ hold fast your profession he says now look at verse 15 it says for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, he look at the word for. That means he's connecting these words with what he said previously. Previously, he said, let us hold fast our profession. Why? Why should we hold fast our profession? He gives a third reason why we should hold fast our profession. And the third reason is... Uh, because we have a high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, a high priest is one who can sympathize and empathize with us. And that's something you must believe with all your heart. He is not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of your infirmities. When you are going through the most difficult times, probably you have a disease an incurable disease probably you're suffering with some sickness and you think you know there is pain in your body and you think does Jesus Christ really understand my infirmity does he really understand the pain I'm going through yes he does yes he does and he cares for you that's very important because he understands what you go through he can sympathize with you he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now one might think that because he is God, he can never know what it means to be human and to suffer infirmities like we do. That's why it's important that you must believe that Jesus Christ is 100% man, was 100% man when he was on the earth at the first coming. That's why it's important to, to understand the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was tempted in all points just like we are yet without sin he was tempted in all points like as we are now he didn't just come and finish his work mechanically as if nothing affected him whatsoever it's not like you know he was some superhuman uh, who could take anything without feeling any pain or anything no he was a normal human being he could experience pain and he did he hungered he he was thirsty he was tired Right, And he experienced pain. He was 100% human being. He did not do his work. He did not live on this earth just as God. 
but he was a hundred percent man. He was a perfect human being. There's no doubt about that. In his flesh at the first coming, the Lord Jesus Christ was like Adam before Adam fell into sin. That's how he was. Perfect. Without sin. Yet he, in the physical body, that's why he could experience pain and suffering in the human body. And he endured what we as humans go through. And this is important for you to understand and believe with all your heart. Now look at what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he was tempted in all points as we are. And these are the only three categories that the devil uses to tempt us. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life. <coughs> and Jesus Christ was tempted in all three points. If you go back and study his temptation in the gospel of uh, Matthew chapter 4 or Luke chapter 4, you will see that the devil used the same three temptations that he used against Eve. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The same things were used by the devil against the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted in all points like as we are. Now there are, these are the three uh, very clear categories of temptations that we face and that Eve faced. But I want you to understand this. Being a sinless human being that the Lord Jesus Christ was does not mean that he could not be tempted in the same way that we are tempted and it does not mean that he could not have fallen into sin now I know I'm treading very dangerous ground with conservative Baptist preaching and theology preachers and theology it's very I, I know what I'm saying goes dead against what most conservatives believe but as a Bible believing Christian I believe what I'm about to tell you now there is this doctrine called the impeccability of the Lord Jesus Christ that is taught in every systematic theology class in every Bible college Protestant Bible college they teach you the impeccability of Christ you know what they teach you the impeccability of Christ again is taught not scripturally but philosophically just like Calvinism and it's the Calvinists mostly who teach this doctrine of the impeccability of Christ you know what they say Christ not only did not sin the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the earth as a human being, not only did he not sin, but he could not sin, they say. And you say, why? Why couldn't he sin? They say, because he was God, 100% God. Now you see, that's a philosophical argument. That's not a scriptural argument. And it's, uh, and it's not a common sense argument, I would say. Common sense tells you that if Jesus Christ could not fall into sin, then all his temptations were useless. Do you think that the being that God calls perfect in wisdom is so foolish to try and tempt the Lord Jesus Christ to sin when he knew he would not fall into sin? And if Jesus could not fall into sin, he can never understand the pain and suffering that we go through when we are faced with these temptations. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You know how it is born again believers. When you are walking with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and you want to please him in every aspect of your life and you have a wonderful prayer life and you go out and then there is this solicitation to sin, this temptation comes up and you know that pain that you experience in trying to resist that temptation it almost affects you physically sometimes and if Jesus Christ never experienced it how can he understand what you and I go through in resisting sin how can he sympathize with us when we fall into sin when he could never fall into sin the doctrine of the impeccability of Jesus Christ does not mean that he could not fall into sin but it's something much greater than that. It means that though there was a possibility for him to fall into sin, just like Adam, remember? He was perfect, he was sinless, but he could be tempted and he was tempted and he fell into sin. Eve was perfect and sinless. She was tempted and she fell into sin. Jesus Christ was perfect and sinless. There was a possibility for him to fall into sin. But the greatness of Jesus Christ is that he overcame where Adam and Eve failed. That's the greatness of our great high priest. 
He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. That's the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though there was a possibility for him to, to fall into sin, he overcame. Now because there was a possibility for Jesus Christ to sin, the devil came and tempted him. Or else the devil is not a fool to go and tempt him when he knew he would never fall into sin. And that would greatly diminish the glorious victory of the Lord Jesus Christ over the temptations that he faced in his life. If he could not sin, what is his greatness in overcoming those sins? Nothing great about it. Make me like that and I would also be great. Well, I would never sin again if you can make me immune to temptation. You see how this so-called false doctrine of uh, the impeccability of Christ diminishes the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ? But the scriptures are very clear. He was tempted in all points like as we are. That means there was a possibility he could fall into sin just like we do. But because he overcame and yet he was without sin, he is able to understand the pain that we go through. Now, I want you to understand this also, that <clears throat> the temptations of the Lord Jesus Christ were not just solicitation to sin. It was not just uh, a temptation which... Uh, tr sought to make him fall into sin but his temptations again a second part of that understanding is that temptations are also the sufferings that he went through yes he was tempted to sin but he overcame but his temptations were also his trials and the tribulations and the sufferings and the rejection that he faced as a human being he experienced sufferings just like you and I do to a much greater degree than you and I do. You know why? Because <coughs> he was sinless, remember? And he is the son of God. Pure, holy, undefiled, harmless. And when he was presented with these vile temptations, solicitations to sin, you can imagine how uh, uh, pained and troubled his soul would have been. This holy son of God, who is the creator of all mankind, was treated so shamefully upon the cross. Can you imagine the pain he would have experienced? You and I can never understand it because we are not what he is. The son of God, 100% God and 100% sinless, perfect, holy, harmless, undefiled son of God. That's why his suffering was much more than any human being can ever experience ever and yet he never sinned he never doubted God you know when Jesus Christ cried out on the cross and said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me shall I tell you something he was not doubting the love of his father he was not saying oh I never expected you to do this no in his pain he's crying out and he's stating a fact God did really forsake him at that moment when he became sin for us. Till then, his holy, sinless son of God was uh, very dear to the Father. But that moment when your sins and my sins were placed upon him, and he not just bore our sins, but he became sin for us. At that moment, God could not look upon his son. He could not have the same fellowship with his son that he did before. The fellowship between the son and the father was broken. When he became sin for us. That's why he cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In other words, he's saying, Do not forsake me, O Father. You are all I have in this world. But the Father had to forsake him. And he did. For those moments when he became sin for us. But the thing that I'm trying to say is that Jesus Christ suffered in a much higher degree than you and I could ever suffer. And in that suffering, he never doubted his father. He never stopped trusting his father. Remember at, on the cross, the last words that he spake were, spoke were, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, commend my spirit. He trusted God till the very last dying moment of his life. He never wavered in his faith. When he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was, uh, why hast thou forsaken me? He was only stating a fact. He was not 
giving vent to his unbelief. Never for a moment. Never. That's our great high priest. He suffered for us much more than we can ever imagine. That's why he can understand the pain and the suffering that we go through and he can sympathize with us. That is the great high priest that we have. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18. Hebrews 2 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So his temptation, again, let me say, was not only temptation to sin, but his temptations were also his trials and his sufferings. It says, he himself hath suffered being tempted. That's why he's able to succor those who are tempted. That's why he's able to comfort those who are tempted. Brethren, we have a great high priest who knows every pain that we go through. He knows and understands every suffering in this world. He knows it. And that's why when you go through such a situation, we have a great high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. That's why he's able to succor them that come to him and that are tempted. The crowning glory of these words in verse 15 are yet without sin, yet without sin. When he was tempted to sin, he did not sin. When he suffered, he did not sin. Like a lot of Christians, when they go through severe suffering, they immediately start doubting God. They start murmuring against God. They start complaining. They become bitter with God. Now, I'm not being judgmental about them at all. If I were in their situation, probably that's how I would react as well. But that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to be like Paul who said, I know whom I have believed. I know him. He's my great high priest. He was 100% human being on the earth. He finished his work. He's seated at the right hand of God. And now he's interceding for me. He is the son of God. He's not just a man, but he's God. And he has, uh, as God came down to this earth, lived a holy life. But he's passed into the heavens. He's passed into the heavens. And there he is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Why is he interceding for us? Because he can sympathize with us. He knows the feeling of our infirmities. He can understand what it means to be in the situation that you are in Christian today. In uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Hebrews 5 verse 8 it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, as a human being, there were things that he still had to learn. Yes, he was perfect, but there were things that he learned only when he suffered. Before that, even he didn't know what it means to suffer, what it would mean to experience such pain. But he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. The Bible calls him a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was rejected by men. He knew what it was to go through such terrible suffering, to go through such terrible shame. That's why he's able to succor you, com uh, to comfort you when you yourself are suffering uh, and uh, going through temptations. It is these three reasons that make our Lord Jesus Christ a great high priest. A great high priest. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest, we need to hold fast our profession of faith in him. Now, there's another verse I want you to look at. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 2. Hebrews 5 verse 2. Again, it's talking about the great high priest in verse 1. In verse 2, he says, Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassion with infirmity. Uh, he's talking about the human um, high priest in verse 1. And Jesus Christ, who was a human being, understands this. He can also have compassion on us, just like the high priest, human high priest can have compassion on us. He can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also 
is compassed with infirmity. Yes, Jesus Christ was not uh, compassed with infirmity as such, but he suffered. He suffered just like you and I suffered. And that's why he can have compassion on us. And this is something you need to believe, Christian, before the practical side comes in. The first is the doctrinal thing. You need to get your doctrine right. Without that, your practice will not be right. If you don't believe the correct things about the Lord Jesus Christ, then your faith in him would not be as it should be. It's as simple as that. Even a Sunday school child can understand this. But if you believe what God wants you to believe about his son, Jesus Christ, then your faith in him will be strong. In times of trouble, it's your faith that will help you remember that. That's why you need to study the scriptures. You need to search the scriptures. Remember what Jesus said in John 5.39. He said, search the scriptures. It's a commandment, by the way. And in all the new English versions, they change the verse in John 5.39 from a command to a statement. In the new versions, it says, you search the scriptures thinking that you will find life in them. No, that's not what Jesus said at all. He said, search the scriptures. It's a mandate. It's a mandatory thing. He says, it's an order. It's a command. He says, search the scriptures for in them ye think there is life. But these are they which testify of me. The scriptures testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why you need to uh, learn everything you need to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you don't have to go to a Bible college to learn about Jesus Christ. You need to go to the scriptures. Believe every word in this book. And if you read the Bible in the English language, take an old authorized English version, authorized version of 1611, the King James Bible, the old version, not the new King James. The new King James is a very perverted translation. Go to the old King James and search the scriptures like the Berean search the scriptures to see what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. You need to know whom you have believed. And you need to be very sure about what you have believed. And once you have faith in every word in this book as the inner and infallible word of God containing the words of God completely preserved, then you can confidently Look up what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, both in the Old and the New Testaments. And then your faith in him also will be very strong. It will help you in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, in your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. First comes this part of trusting Jesus Christ, uh, not only as your savior, but as your great high priest. Your great high priest is there in heaven interceding for you. And we have seen what makes him a great high priest. But the second part of the sermon, the Lord willing, we will look at next week would be verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 4. And there we will look at the practical side of what we should do when we go through sufferings. Once your belief is right, then your practice would be right. And that would give you great comfort in the midst of your discouragement. Christian, God doesn't want you to be in this miserable condition of discouragement and defeat. Most of the times, remember, when you are discouraged and when you experience defeat, the next step would be self-pity. You start pitying yourself and you will start thinking, look, God is also not having any mercy on me. God is not showing me any pity. Oh, my poor soul. You know, you start pitying yourself and that's very dangerous. Never indulge in self-pity. The devil will use it to take you deeper and deeper into depression. Never indulge in self-pity. Never do that. That's why you need to know whom you have believed. So that you will never doubt or waver for a moment that he loves you and he cares for you. And he understands every problem and every suffering and every pain that you go through. Gives you great comfort and discouragement. And once again, let me tell you this. If you are a born again Christian trying to walk closely with the Lord Jesus Christ, discouragement is one of uh, a very, very strong weapon that the devil uses against you. Great men of God, great men of prayer often uh, would lapse into uh, uh, discouragement in their lives. If you read uh, their biographies, you would see that. Take, for example, Charles Spurgeon, that great English preacher of uh, the 19th century. 
a great man of God, no doubt. But often he would lapse into discouragement and disappointment and depression also sometimes. Because he had this terrible physical suffering, pain in his body. Christian, the devil can use that to take you. But if you know whom you have believed in, and if you know what you should do in such a condition, your discouragement will turn into great faith. And it will turn into a great defeat for the devil and a great victory for your faith. And that's what God wants in your life. That's why it's important. You need to know whom you have believed in. You have believed in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became a man, who lived a holy and perfect and sinless life as a perfect human being, who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He went to the cross. He suffered on the cross, not just for your sins and mine, but for the sins of every sinner on this earth. For all mankind, he suffered on the cross. He shed his blood and he became sin for us on that cross. All the sins of all mankind were placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins were placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he suffered, he bled, and he died. And he rose up again. And if you have never trusted this great truth, then now would be the time for you to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you believe he did all this for you? Do you believe he suffered in your stead? Do you believe that he paid the penalty for your sins when he suffered on the cross? Do you believe he shed his precious blood to redeem you from your sins? He did. And you must know that he did all this for you personally and you can't say I believe Jesus died for the whole world that won't give you salvation you must believe that he died for you you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died in your place was buried and rose up again from the dead because God had accepted his sacrifice now when you trust this you know what happens Jesus Christ comes to live inside of you and he is the righteousness of God. So you are given the righteousness of God and your unrighteousness and sins are placed upon Jesus Christ, upon the cross. And you are justified. That means you are declared righteous before God because you are covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God looks at you. He says, you are no longer a sinner worthy of hell. You are my child. You are righteous. You are as righteous as my son Jesus Christ. That's what happens. That's why the Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That can only happen when you trust Jesus Christ as your savior. Then that great transaction takes place. Your sins upon Jesus Christ, his righteousness in you. What are you trusting for your salvation? What have you trusted in to get you to heaven? Have you trusted in your religion? That will take you to hell. Have you trusted in uh, your priest? That will take you to hell. Have you trusted in uh, that so-called uh, sacrament of the bread and wine, which you believe become the literal body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? That will take you straight to hell. The wrath of God abides on you if you believe in all these things to save you. Or you may say, I'm so educated, I do not believe in God. That's all for superstitious people. That's not for me. Your education will take you to hell. You say, that which is not scientifically proven, I cannot believe. What I cannot see, I, I will not believe. These are the kind of things people come up with. They are so foolish. You will die in your sins and you will go to hell one day where you will burn forever and ever. But you don't have to go there, you see, because God, who is rich in mercy and love, has given his son to die on the cross for your sins, for your sins. He died in your place and he rose up again from the dead. And if you believe this, if you believe that Jesus personally did all this for you, then you will be saved. Nothing in this world can save you. Absolutely nothing. Your good works, your, your moral life, these things will not save you. Because you will never ever match up to the righteousness of God. Unless you are as holy as God, you cannot save yourself. And you can never be, if you have sinned even once in your life, you can never be as holy as God. Even an infant child that is born in this world is not as holy as God. It may be innocent, but not holy. 
And unless you are as holy as God, you can't go to heaven. The Bible says that your good works are as filthy rags before God. Your righteousness is as filthy rags before God. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that uh, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's why you need to trust Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And trust him as your savior and ask him to save your soul and to give you eternal life. You will be a child of God and escape the horrible place called hell. And in this life, find great comfort and strength to face every trouble and every suffering and every uh, pain that comes your way. Jesus will be in you and he will be with you and he will strengthen you. And if you're a born again Christian, make sure you know whom you have believed in. We, the Lord willing, we will continue uh, looking at this for another Sunday and then we will finish with the subject of comfort to the discouraged. I hope and pray that this message, this sermon has been a source of strength and comfort to you Christian. God bless you. Yeah, thank you all brethren. Thank you so much. Uh, Brother Albert, Brother Lawrence, Brother Jimmy Bennett, Brother Ravi Karthik, Brother Paul Malik, Brother Ravi, Brother Landon Dunn, Karthik. Thank you all. God bless you brothers.